All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Morningstar solar charge controllers and inverters. Uh, my name is Jake Sherry. I'm a sales engineer with Morningstar. And joining me today is applications engineer Doug Grubbs. Uh, Doug's going to help answer any questions you have at the end of the webinar. Um, so if you do have any questions that come up during the presentation, uh, feel free to just type them into the chat box, that little window at the bottom of the GoToWebinar pane. Um, and then we can just address as many of those as possible um, at the end. Now you can see the agenda in the lower right part of the screen there. Um, so I'll try to uh, stick pretty true to that order. Um, start out with a brief intro about Morningstar, just who we are as a company. Um, give you a little overview of charge controllers and inverters. And then we'll get more specifically into the two different types of charge controllers, those being PWM and MPPT. And then um, go on to a discussion about efficiency and oversizing, which are two criteria that are pretty helpful in uh, distinguishing between the two different types of controllers. Um, We'll go into a deep dive for the uh, individual Morningstar products, and then we'll end with that Q&A. So without further hesitation, let's go on and give a little overview about Morningstar. All right, so who is Morningstar? Morningstar is a US-based company, um, and for more than 20 years, we've been a leading supplier of both solar charge controllers and inverters. And we're a bit unique in the industry. We've maintained the same ownership, management, and distribution partners since our very beginning. Um, our customers typically associate Morningstar with having very high product quality. Uh, we usually send out a survey every year and um, continuously get the A rating from our customers, which we're very thankful for. Um, and since our inception back in 1993, we've sold over 3 million uh, products into the field. All right, so the type of applications that we're talking about here will, where you'll typically find Morningstar controllers, um, they're classified as remote sites. Uh, so they're not connected to any electricity grid. Uh, no utility company is making any regulations. Um, all of the power is being supplied and generated by the system itself. So they're completely self-sustaining. Um, now, the main reason why this might make sense for people that are an off-grid system rather than connecting into, say, a utility grid, um, it's mostly predicated on cost. And cost alone, um, the figure that we uh, typically hear is $15,000 per mile of wire to connect to a utility grid. Um, and that's just the base cost. That can go up if there are uh, various terrain impediments um, that would make it more difficult to connect to the grid. You know, you have, you're going over mountains, through rivers or forests or anything like that. Uh, that's going to jack up the cost. So in those cases, it really makes sense to consider an off-grid uh, solar system. Um, but not only solar, you also have other types of off-grid systems. Um, you have, you know, the common fuel generators, um, and you also have wind and hydro systems in addition to the solar. Um, and you know, for high power needs, if that's your uh, primary motivation, you, it makes a lot of sense to consider fuel generators. Um, but it does kind of go against the grain of um, having a pure, clean, renewable energy source because you have CO2 emissions. Um, you have to continuously give uh, provide for the fuel costs. And not only the cost of the fuel itself, but also the cost to transport the fuel to that site, um, which is often overlooked, but quite substantial, especially if you're in a remote site that's only accessible by helicopter. Those helicopter flights aren't cheap. So um, sometimes it makes more sense to consider uh, other alternatives. Wind and hydro systems can sometimes be considered, but you really have to have a ripe environment, um, the right climate for those to work successfully. Um, and not all places do. So um, the most widespread use would be solar, especially if your power needs are not astronomically high, um, as most of the scenarios we'll see on the next slides and talk about for Morningstar applications. Um, solar is really an excellent source of power. And in places that experience a limited amount of sunshine, 
you can always consider a hybrid system that combines multiple uh, sources, uh, input sources of power. So you can have solar, wind, and hydro, and we got a fuel generator as well. So on this slide, you'll see some examples of uh, common applications where our products fit into. Um, in addition to the common residential and mobile home systems, you'll also find our uh, products in a lot of industrial applications, such as um, you know remote oil and gas sites, uh, telecommunication sites. Um, you'll have remote monitoring and traffic applications, in addition to lighting and railroad. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that these are different from the traditional grid-tied solar systems that uh, you know most of the industry is made up on, uh, made up of. You know, in having uh, solar rooftops um, in neighborhoods where homeowners are actually actively selling back the power um, that they generate from their solar system to the utility company, um, and likewise, you know, those panels that you see on uh, you know, the tops of football stadiums or other uh, commercial buildings, they're generally connected to the grid. So they're not completely self-sustaining. They're not um, you know, supplying their own power entirely, uh, whereas Morningstar products are typically used in the, the self-sustaining off-grid systems. Um, the diagram on the next couple slides, you'll see, uh, they'll give you a better idea of how we physically fit into the system and uh, the significance of the individual products um, and their function. So in this particular diagram here, we have a typical off-grid system consisting of your solar array, uh, your charge controller, your batteries, and your, in this case, DC load. Um, so it's uh, basically what's happening here through this process is sunlight striking the uh, the solar modules, it's converting it into DC uh, power, which is being um, filtered into the charge controller. The charge controller is regulating that combination of current and voltage um, to the battery and then giving any excess or, or giving the uh, power that's required to the load based on its current draw and then giving any excess to the battery to maintain a uh, a proper high state of charge. So that's essentially how um, the typical off-grid system works. And during the evening when you're not getting any sunlight, the battery power is um, used to run the load all alone. So uh, you have to build in an amount of autonomy to keep those loads running if you want them to go throughout the night. Now, you notice that the battery in this uh, diagram is grounded. You'll see these um, green hash marks here indicating the ground on the negative battery terminal. And this, uh, to put it into context, is because all of our PWM and MPPT controllers, they have what's called a common negative. Um, so the physical connections inside the controller, uh, the negatives are connected so that you can ground the system in one place but essentially get um, the same effective ground of the uh, solar panels, the batteries, and the load. Everything in the system is then grounded through a central location. Um, and that's not uh, how it's configured with every charge controller, so it is important to uh, make that distinction. Um, and this does meet NEC code requirements. Um, if you do need an equipment ground for any kind of metal parts or uh, the enclosure, some of our controllers do include uh, what's called an equipment ground lug, uh, a terminal lug inside the controller um, connected to the actual casing, and that can physically ground the, uh, the exposed metal or anything else in the system. Um, if there isn't an actual lug, you can just connect it to anywhere on the enclosure itself. And in this example, the system is delivering power, again, to a DC load. So this is, you know, just say an LED. Um, that receives DC power, uh, but on the next slide we'll show you a derivation of this configured for AC loads, um, more common, you know, residential home type loads. The, uh, in this case we're looking at just a TV, general consumer product configured to receive AC, um, AC power, and it pretty much is exactly the same as the previous diagram except 
we've added an inverter, which is drawing power from the battery bank, uh, converting it from DC to AC to power this load. Um, we do have one uh, pure sine wave inverter product in our uh, portfolio. I'll talk about that briefly in a little bit. Um, and that just tells you, uh, you know, the various permutations of systems that you can have configured for either DC or AC loads. Now on the next slide we'll talk about um, charge controllers and the basic algorithm that it uses to keep the batteries at a proper health and state of charge. So uh, the algorithm that battery chargers use is typically multi-stage. Um, at the two main stages you see here in uh, this depiction of a battery, we have bulk charging, which um, is going to be the initial when your battery is at a low state of charge. Your charge controller is going to send all of the current that it's collecting from that solar array into the battery as much as the uh, controller can handle. And typically by the time you're done with that bulk charge phase, just like if you were shooting a, a fire hose into a bucket, you don't want to have it on full blast for too long. When you get towards the top, you worry about it overflowing, so you're going to start to dial back the flow. Um, and so you're going to dial back the, the amount of current going into the battery. And you get to about 80 to 90 percent state of charge, at which point you're going to switch over to the next phase, which is called absorption. And absorption is, again, just when you start to dial back that current over time, typically a time period that lasts anywhere from one to three hours. Um, you're just going to give the battery enough current to maintain a constant elevated voltage um, that's going to try and get you as close to the, uh, the top state of charge as possible. Typically when you're finished absorption you're around 98 percent state of charge uh, at which point you know through empirical uh, testing on lead acid batteries you don't want to keep them at too high a voltage for too long so in order to get that last couple of a percent, uh, couple percentage points of the uh, state of charge, you're going to dial the current back even further. Now you're just giving it an occasional pulse, basically what's known as trickle charging or float charging. Um, and so that's going to help you get as close to a full complete state of charge as possible. Um, you'll also notice that there is this fourth optional uh, equalization phase. And the equalization phase is not required for all battery types. Um, in fact, it's only intended for flooded batteries, uh, those with open vents, um, because you're effectively getting the battery to its highest voltage that it can possibly maintain, boiling that active ingredient in the, in the battery, making sure that all of the energy is evenly distributed, all of the specific gravities of each individual battery cells are evenly charged. Um, and so you don't want to do that with sealed batteries or, you know, valve regulated batteries um, because they don't have any way to vent that excess gassing, uh, whereas flooded do because they're open to the atmosphere. They have uh, distilled water that can evaporate through those uh, vents. Um, so it is important to remember that uh, what dictates how often you do an equalization charge is really based on how deeply you discharge your battery on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, some flooded batteries will only require you to do it once a month. Other batteries, you know, like L16 batteries may require you to do it every two weeks. So it really depends. You want to um, make sure you're in close coordination with whatever the battery manufacturer recommends. And again, this multi-stage battery charging process is um, typically pertains to lead acid batteries, but really any battery chemistry has a derivation of this. Um, it may eliminate certain phases, extend others, and so forth. But any of our charge controllers that are custom programmable, and many are, um, are capable of charging any chemistry, including those that you might see um, as shown on this next slide. So, you know, lithium batteries are starting to gain a lot of traction. Uh, you can use our controllers with lithium batteries. Um, anything that is custom programmable just 
requires you to get the, uh, the voltage set points from the manufacturer and program them into the charge controller and away you go. Um, you also see some other less conventional uh, types of batteries, nickel, cadmium, um, you know, uh, saltwater batteries like the aqueous hybrid ion um, and flow batteries as well. They can all be accommodated by those custom programmable charge controllers from Morningstar. Um, now just to talk about the purpose of a charge controller where um, what you're investing in when you're trying to um, to source one on the market, what you're looking for it to do is its primary function, maintain the battery at its highest state of charge, but also protect the battery from overcharge. So it has to have um, a degree of awareness to put enough current into the battery, but not overcharge it. And also you'll find features like lo load control. If you're running any DC loads through the, the charge controller, the charge controller is able to sense uh, the battery voltage and use what's called low voltage disconnect to prevent over discharging of the battery when your load is drawing current away from that uh, battery. So, um, you know, this is typically going to be seen if you're running heavy loads at night and you don't have any solar power, then your, your battery uh, storage capacity is going to start to come down. If it goes below a certain voltage, it'll cut off the load so that you don't damage the battery irreparably. Um, and load control effectively, you know, is just helping to maximize that available battery capacity and cycle life. Um, you also find features like lighting control. That's uh, fairly common for turning lights on and off, say at a, a parking garage or a bus stop shelter or something. Um, so those are some typical features you might find in uh, charge controllers. They can also, um, you can also get a lot of useful information from charge controllers pertaining to the operation of the entire system. Um, and so, you know, they'll use different status indicators, meters, LEDs to convey information. Um, you know, maybe they'll show you the battery voltage, the current going into and out of the battery, It'll give you any kind of operating temperature um, alerts or any kind of system diagnostics that are important to know um, to protect against any problems coming up. Uh, and some controllers can also log data over weeks and months. So if you're able to compile that information um, into you know, a chart, you can get some useful uh, perspective about how the performance is, uh, how the system is performing over the long run, any uh, changes you need to make in terms of uh, making it more efficient. Um, and some controllers can even facilitate remote communication of this information to uh, power systems as well through a number of different communication uh, protocols and interfaces. So when you're looking at the whole system costs overall of your you know, off-grid uh, system, typically a charge controller is only going to account for about 10% of those total costs. Uh, a good controller you can really see will help to extend the battery life and batteries are really the, uh, the primary expenditure that you're trying to protect. Um, they may be 40% of your upfront costs and possibly up to 80% of your costs over the lifetime of the system. So that's really, you know, you're investing 10% of the system costs in the charge controller, but it's protecting much more than just itself. Um, and a poor controller, you know, can cause battery failure and it can take down your whole system. So you don't want to uh, cut corners in getting a so-so uh, charge controller. You really want to have the best quality that you can buy. Um, and, you know, after all, you can invest all that money in the best batteries, uh, all the best modules, all this other name brand equipment. They're only going to be as reliable as your controller. So uh, definitely put a lot of thought into that decision. So now that we've completed a general overview here um, of solar charge controllers, we'll take a look at the two different types more specifically. Um, so the two major categories are both pulse width modulation, or PWMs, uh, and maximum power point tracking controllers, or MPPTs. So just to highlight some of the differences in the, the bare functionality between the two, pulse width modulation uh, controllers are just switching a series element, 
you know, just think of it as a, a power transistor, just an uh, open, close type of thing. And at, it's doing this at high frequency, and it's doing it for variable lengths of time, which is regulating the amount of charge current flowing into the batteries. So NPPT controllers, on the other hand, are um, a slightly more advanced variation of the same theme, deploying uh, microprocessors, um, you know, newer technology to optimize the battery charging uh, based on what's available under any number of conditions uh, on the input side. And it's providing, therefore, more charging, squeezing every bit of power it can get from the array and making sure it goes into the battery as efficiently as possible. Um, so we'll use some diagrams on the next slide, and they should help you to uh, better visualize what's going on here. So on this particular graph, we have a plot of uh, charging current that the PWM controller is delivering to the batteries over time. And um, what it's doing here, again, it's the PWM controllers um, are opening and closing that internal switch uh, mechanism at variable lengths of time, high frequency. And so what's happening is at a low state of charge, when the battery needs more current in, that gate or that switch is going to be closed as often as possible. You'll start to see the voltage of the battery go up. And correspondingly, um, the the pulse width will get narrower because the battery doesn't need quite as much as it's getting toward the top in its state of charge. Uh, so by the time you're at full state of charge, that's when your you know pulse width, uh, that you're in flow charging, that's the trickle. You're just getting an occasional pulse there, um, really narrow, and most of the time the switch is open. So that's effectively um, how a PWM controller is working internally. Um, and so the inherent limitation of a PWM controller is that it can really only operate at battery voltage. Um, the array has to be pre-configured uh, to match whatever voltage battery you're charging because it's going to have a certain output um, that's going to be configured to flow from a slightly higher voltage to your lower voltage uh, of your battery but it can't stray too far away from battery voltage. So the controller is, what it's doing internally is adjusting its internal resistance um, to make sure that only 12 volts of electricity is coming through from the array into the battery bank to, to match that 12 volt, uh, 12 volt system voltage. Um, now, with PWM controllers, you can have an array that's larger, uh, can have higher voltage, um, than, you know, what, what you would ideally want, but you're really not going to get any benefit to that. That added voltage is not being converted into additional power to go into the battery. So, uh, and in some cases, if the voltage is too high, you can damage the PWM controller. So you always want to make sure that if you're uh, charging, you know, you have a 12-volt nominal array used to charge a 12-volt nominal battery. So the voltages have to match. In other words, you're using a PWM controller here with a 12-volt battery. The array needs to be made up of 36 cell modules. You just use you know, one single uh, module, 36 cells. That's configured for 12 volts. And then for a 24-volt battery, um, you can use a 72-cell module or two 36 cells in series. Um, but again, you want to have that 24-volt nominal rating of the array matching the 24-volt nominal rating of the battery. And similarly, for the 48-volt, uh, you could use two 72 cells in series, and that'll equate to your 48-volt nominal voltage um, for the battery. So MPPT controllers, uh, on the other hand, they're, they're operating at not battery voltage, but what's called the maximum power voltage. And this is typically higher than your battery voltage. So the controller is adjusting its, its resistance, just like the PWMs, but it's actually able to allow higher voltage to come through from the array because internally it can do what's called a DC to DC conversion, uh, turn that voltage differential into more current that's going into your battery on the other side. So 
you need to understand that this is still conservation of power. You're not creating uh, energy here or anything. You're just changing the, the form factor from the input to the output. So on the input, you're taking higher voltage, lower current. And then on the output, you're going to step down to battery voltage. So it's a lower voltage, but you're getting more current um, because you've converted that additional voltage on the input into current on the output. Um, so, but power is more or less conserved. You still P equals I times V in equals out. So um, minus, you know, a, a slight loss in uh, conversion efficiency, um, which should be stated by the manufacturer on the data sheet. Um, but for the most part, power in equals power out. Um, so how do we get to this concept of maximum power voltage? And how is it delivered to the controller? How is it determined? Well, the controller is doing these sophisticated high speed calculations. Um, and we'll show you in the next slide essentially what it's doing um, from a conceptual view. So this slide shows a, uh, two different graphs. Uh, you have your typical current versus voltage or IV curve um, as shown here configured for a 12 volt nominal module. And then you have your PV curve uh, for again that same module uh, showing you the differences in where uh, MPPT controllers can benefit in terms of the um, increasing the energy harvested into the battery. So MPPT controllers um, can, the whole objective is to operate at what's known as the maximum power voltage or the maximum power point of any given uh, um, module or array. And so that's right, that's found right here on the knee of this curve. And that's where the product of voltage versus cur uh, times current is going to be the highest. So therefore, you're maximizing the area under this curve, that being uh, the power. So because MPPT controllers have the hardware, the uh, sophisticated internal processors doing these high speed calculations to um, determine the input operating parameters, it is allowing the controller to operate uh, out here and capture all of the energy that's put through at the array's maximum power voltage, which for a, for a 12 volt nominal module typically corresponds to about 17 volts. Now, with the P, if you were using a PWM controller, your array voltage is going to fluctuate with battery voltage. So you're only ever able to harvest this area, but you can't quite get out to the knee of this curve, which is where you're actually going to get the highest product of both current and voltage. So MPPT, you need an MPPT to squeeze out that a little bit, a little bit additional power um, that you can gain, especially in uh, colder conditions. And I'll go into that a, a little bit later. So these are, um, this is just a chart of some main uh, differing characteristics between the two types of controllers. What you'll find in the industry is that PWM controllers tend to be smaller, uh, less hardware. Um, you know, you don't need the, uh, um, you don't need uh, capacitors which take up a lot of space and other uh, electrical components. Um, they operate at battery voltage, again, as I mentioned. Um, the MPPTs can operate above that, so they have a much higher voltage threshold than the PWMs can tolerate. Um, and not only that, not only can they tolerate it, but they can actually squeeze additional power uh, from the array in being able to operate at that voltage. So MPPT is typically more suitable for those larger modules that have higher voltage, um, but also keep in mind that those larger modules have higher power output, but they represent a better, uh, a lower cost per watt. So um, you're spending more on an MPPT controller versus a PWM because it's more sophisticated, but you're actually saving cost, um, at least relative to the power produced uh, for those particular modules. So it is pretty, um, there's some benefit on both sides. And the superior performance, as I mentioned, of, of the MPPTs over the PWMs is going to be accentuated even more so in cold weather because that's when your PV voltage is typically going to 
rise um, and your batteries are going to be at the lower end of their state of charge. So increasing that, that voltage differential, there's a lot more current that can be converted from that into the battery. So you'll see uh, a lot of benefit in using an MPPT in those situations. So we'll take a look at some specific examples of uh, the PWMs and the MPPTs from Morningstar. Um, here we'll start with the PWMs. We have our TriStar on the uh, larger end, we have our ProStar, have our SunSaver, uh, SunSaver Duo. This is one I particularly like. It's used a lot in mobile applications. Um, our Sunlight, SunKeeper, and SunGuard are uh, very common MPPT controllers, uh, sorry, PWM controllers. Um, and then we'll highlight just a few of these to uh, give you an idea of what some common features to expect would be. Um, so here we're looking at the SunSaver. This is um, one of our smaller PWM controllers, but the biggest differentiator with this one is that it's used, it's suitable for use in environments where say maybe you have flammable chemicals. Um, you know, oil and gas sites uh, typically use this because it's certified to a standard uh, known as class one division two, and that means it's suitable for hazardous locations. Um, now it's also FCC compliant, so it's suitable for telecommunication applications as well, low noise interference. Um, and it, this particular model comes in six, 10, and 20 amp versions and each one is configured for either 12 or 24 volt battery systems. Um, it's only about six inches long, and it weighs just about a half a pound. All right, so the next one we have here is our mid-range PWM. It's called the ProStar. Uh, it's currently in its second generation, but it was the original was introduced over 20 years ago. Uh, this was actually Morningstar's original um, entry into the charge controller market. And some of the earlier generation ProStars are actually still in use today. It's pretty impressive, designed with a 15-year life cycle, but some obviously getting much more than that. Um, and this product can be used in virtually any residential, uh, mobile, or off-grid industrial application. It's just really highly versatile uh, for that mid-range sweet spot. Um, it comes in either 15 or 30 amp versions. Uh, and each one is uh, configurable for 12, 24. Uh, 12 and 24 go together on some models, and then others are uh, particularly configured for 48 volt battery systems. Um, and this comes both in metered and non-metered versions, uh, and they all have that DC load control that I was talking about, the low voltage disconnect uh, feature. So next we have the TriStar. This is one of our most common PWM controllers. Um, it supports three different operating modes. That's actually how it got its name, TriStar. Um, so it can be used for solar charging, load control, or diversion control. Um, but again, I like to point out that it cannot be used to do all of those things at the same time. Um, so if you do need multiple uh, functions to be performed within the same system simultaneously, you do need to have a separate controller, um, either another TriStar, say one to do the charging control, another to do the load control, or uh, as is more common, you'd probably see somebody using the TriStar for the charging to get more current into the battery and then using uh, for smaller load requirements just a smaller PWM controller like either the, the SunSaver or the ProStar that I spoke about earlier. Um, now it operates at full ratings all the way up to its 60 degrees Celsius nameplate um, and it does not need to derate. It's something that's actually pretty unique uh, for controllers in the industry. Many of our competitors from other manufacturers um, will rate it to that maximum temperature but you're only getting a portion of the power available uh, by the time the uh, ambient reaches that temperature it'll start to derate maybe just above room temperature. But ours, you're getting full output all the way through. Um, versions for this particular controller come in both 45 and 60 amp, and each one is configurable for 12 to 48 volt uh, battery systems. Uh, it's typically used in residential applications, but a lot of uh, industrial as well, lighting, traffic, 
uh, Railroad, you'll see a lot of TriStars uh, used in those applications. Um, also, like many of our products, this, uh, the TriStar is equipped with extensive electronic protections. It's something that uh, we focus on very highly to make sure we have the most reliable product. Um, and it also has an RS-232 connection as standard. This will allow you to perform any kind of custom settings adjustments. You can log data and you can uh, communicate that data remotely as well. Um, so on the next slide, we'll talk about the MPPTs. And so here we have, you'll see our TriStar MPPT 600 volt. That's our largest one. The TriStar MPPT, uh, this is the uh, smaller sibling to the TriStar 600 volt. Um, this is with 150 volts open circuit limit, whereas this is 600 volts. Um, this one is our newest MPPT called the ProStar MPPT. And then we have our SunSaver MPPT on the smaller end. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of those. So starting off with the smallest one, um, it's about seven inches uh, long, weighs just over a pound. So it's really easy, portable, um, for you know, considering how much power uh, you can actually get out of the thing. Um, it's rated at 15 amps for both charging and load current. And so you're going to get 200 watts and 400 watts, depending on whether you're using it for a 12 or a 24 volt battery system, respectively. Um, and as is typical of any MPPT controller from, from Morningstar, or I guess you could say in general, you're looking at 5 to 25 percent charging boost. Um, over a PWM controller. Um, now some people use this with a 24 volt nominal PV array and you can actually match that to a 12 volt battery. Uh, that's something that you can't do using a, a PWM controller but again people want to do that because the 24 volt uh, solar panels tend to have more power output and represent better cost per watt. So maybe it, you know, they're more readily available. It makes more sense to uh, use that with a lower voltage battery. Um, and MPPT controllers are also useful in reducing uh, power losses and long wire runs. So even with this small controller, um, it will help you do that. Uh, you have up to 75 volts open circuit to, uh, to size your uh, array. And the peak efficiency for this is 97.5%, which is actually uh, fairly impressive for uh, again, it's small controller. Um, it's used in typically residential lighting, uh, traffic, and railroad applications as well, much like the uh, TriStar PWM. So this one is our newest MPPT controller. Uh, as I mentioned, the ProStar MPPT. I'll spend some time on this um, just because I think it represents really the culmination of uh, everything we've been working toward for 23 years um, in a highly versatile controller. Uh, it's quite impressive. So you see a picture here. We have both non-metered and metered versions. Um, and, the non and both, whether you get it with or without the meter, you can look at 25 or 40 amp spec. And the 25 amp spec indicates that it's 25 amps of charging in addition to 25 amps of load control, uh, whereas the 40 amp spec um, correlates to 40 amps of charging and 30 amps of load rating. Uh, and this device also has automatic battery voltage detection. Um, the SunSaver MPPT has that as well. Um, and it's got a maximum open circuit voltage of 120 volts. Uh, and it's got, again, that characteristic wide operating temperature range uh, that is so common of uh, Morningstar controllers. And you're looking at 98% peak efficiency, so also very impressive for a mid-range offering in this category. Um, now, the ProStar MPPT has what I like to highlight as the largest meter interface of any Morningstar controller that's ever been produced. Um, it can be used in the field to set all kinds of things. Uh, you can change your charging profile. Uh, you can customize your load control. You can even do sophisticated multi-event uh, lighting control straight from the meter. It's really nice. Um, it actually accepts multiple language inputs and uh, has a high level of sophistication in terms of its self-diagnostics. Um, it's constantly running internal diagnostics uh, to make sure that it's 
operation is um, up to par uh, and to see any um, alert you of any potential um, hazards you know coming down the road uh, any errors in system functioning it will let you know um, the device also has Modbus communications so it can um, it can communicate uh, via a number of different interfaces um, it has the standard RJ11 connection uh, on the controller but you can use that um, to go with either RS232 um, 485 or uh, eventually Ethernet um, you can data log up to 256 days and uh, you also it also has a, a really cool feature called temperature foldback um, this is really useful for lithium batteries in particular. As you know, you don't want to charge lithium batteries um, below a certain temperature threshold. So you can basically set the, uh, the cutoff range for when your charge controller will start to linearly derate the amount of current going into the battery. By the time it gets to that low end temperature threshold, it's going to completely cease charging so that it doesn't damage uh, the lithium, it doesn't become volatile. Um, so that's a really useful feature to have uh, when you're charging lithium batteries. Um, it also comes with an optional accessory called a wire box um, and it's much more than what it looks like. Um, it's made of a polycarbonate lexin material so it's extremely durable um, and if you use this to replace the standard cover uh, it actually gives you more wiring room so you have full access to uh, a number two gauge wire terminal. Um, that's a 35 millimeter squared um, and the wire box has enough room to also uh, not only support the larger wire sizes but also use uh, conduit through these conduit knockouts um, there are three on the bottom two on the sides um, the all of them are uh, three-quarter by uh, by one inch and then you also have oh I'm sorry the, the three-quarter by one inch is the large one in the center at bottom and then the rest are half by three quarter inch, um, and so a lot of times, you know, they'll recommend using this uh, cover. Uh, some inspe inspectors may suggest it just for, um, you know, reduce any hazards associated with uh, exposed wires or conduits or connections. You know, make sure you have a, a neat and tidy setup. Um, then moving on, we have the TriStar MPPT. So this one. Uh, is one of our uh, very well-known MPPT products. It comes in both 30, 45, and 60 amp versions. Uh, and all versions of this controller support 12, 24, 48 volt battery systems, uh, anything in between. Um, the peak efficiency is 99%, which actually makes it among the highest, if not the highest, in the industry. Um, and the TriStar MPPT is commonly found in residential, telecom, and railroad applications. So our largest controller um, is the TriStar MPPT 600 volt and it was uh, originally designed for input voltages greater than 150 volts open circuit. So that's where the smaller TriStar MPPT cuts off at 150 and this picks up and allows you to go up to 600 volts. Um, so this gives you, you know, the ability to use really long wire runs, um, greater radial bends from you know, the power input to the controller. Um, it's just very flexible in terms of the system sizing that it allows for. Uh, if you need to increase the size of your PV array, the added benefit of using this controller is that you can just stack those modules on in series and you're not going to incur any of those uh, string sizing issues that are typically associated with smaller controllers. So you have a lot of room to work with, um, but also even with that considered, the peak efficiency surprisingly enough, is 97.9% for this controller, um, which is extremely high when you consider how uh, much voltage it has to convert. It's going from 600 volts down to 48 volts. Uh, so it's really impressive um, that it manages to do that with 97.9% efficiency. Um, that 600 volt nameplate rating is best configured for the 48 volt battery setting. Um, but the controller is also custom programmable for other system voltages, so you can do uh, 24, you can do 60, 36, uh, anything like that. 
Um, and this is commonly found in residential and telecom applications. Um, here you'll see of the controllers uh, listed here the standard version. Um, you'll have the version with the optional disconnect box, the version with the transfer switch. Um, there's two versions with the transfer switch. One comes pre-wired with a uh, matching 600 volt GFPD. Um, and those versions are um, a major component of a solution that is providing battery backup power in typically in residential and light industrial uh, grid-tied solar systems. So if you do uh, have any interest in learning more about that, I invite you to um, either seek out more information on our web page. Web page. You can just type in Morningstar Backup um, into the search bar on MorningstarCorp.com and that will come up where um, you'll see a, a page with a video, some additional resources and informational links. Um, and also, you know, feel free to pose any questions you have about it. Um, it's a pretty unique product. And so just to highlight some common characteristics um, before we wrap up here, um, all Morningstar controllers have a five-year warranty unless otherwise specified. Uh, so that's something that uh, usually puts us um, above, you know, we're on par with the industry. We are supported by select wholesale distributors to maintain our inventory. They are also creating short lead times for us, uh, provides all kind of uh, technical support, um, and they'll even help with broader assistance for selecting and integrating our components with other things that they may sell, including modules, batteries, accessories, um, any other component of an off-grid system. They're really a, a one-stop shop. Uh, and knowledge base. Also, our controllers are manufactured in a certified ISO 9001 facility, which means they are subject to this, the most strict quality control guidelines and they perform uh, very admirably. We're very proud of that. Um, Morningstar controllers are also passively cooled, so they don't have any fans or moving parts. And that's important to note because it is something that could be a potential point of failure um, that we desperately try to avoid. Um, again, we're trying to appeal to a large range of industrial applications here uh, at remote sites and unforgiving conditions. We can't have any failures, and so we, um, we have tried hard to avoid ever having to use fans. Uh, and this is important, you know, if you think about the example of anybody who's ever looked in, you know, uh, their laptop computer, if it has a cooling fan, you know, you open it up, you see all kinds of dust and debris that, that's been collected on that fan. And on the circuit board itself, all the electrical components are covered in dust. Well, it's, it's not good uh, for a computer. It's not going to help it uh, last any longer. And in uh, every case, it's going to degrade the life cycle of that, um, that computer. And also, it's not good for a charge controller. Um, it would cause the charge controller to generate more heat, actually, um, because the, the dust is clogging the, uh, the, the vents where air is flowing. And so then that's going to ultimately degrade the, uh, the lifespan of the controller. And even if that fan or, or other cooling uh, part starts to slow down um, before it ultimately breaks, that occurrence of excess heat generated over time um, is really going to decrease the efficiency as well. Um, so you really want to do everything you can to avoid that. And our controllers, therefore, perform very well throughout a wide range of, of temperatures. They'll go from well below freezing, say minus 40 degrees Celsius, all the way up to uh, 60 degrees Celsius is a fairly common temperature range for Morningstar controllers. Um, they do have lightning and transient surge protection built in, and that's going to help to offer a degree of protection from nearby lightning. Um, but that protection that we use is uh, not mechanical. It's not going to degrade over time. Um, it also has a very fast response time than other uh, methods used. Um, if you do find that you need more enhanced protection against larger surges uh, from lightning or, or anything else, you always have the option of installing an external uh, metal oxide varistor. Um, now, Morningstar is very easy to integrate uh, with any type of solar module, battery, inverter, um, any BOS components. That's something that we really uh, specialize in. We 
try to make our um, products as user-friendly as possible and um, be able to uh, use them in systems that use other manufacturers' components as well without problems. And our customers typically say of our products, you just set it and forget it. You don't have to work, waste your time doing any kind of pre-calibration measurement setup or you don't have to set any kind of sweep times or anything. Um, it's all pre-configured and ready to go. And, uh, and that's what people really like a lot about our products. Um, they are very lightweight for their capacity. Um, you'll find that controllers uh, that are custom programmable, they have firmware that can be updated in the field in just a matter of minutes. Um, so that's a really nice convenience feature for uh, field serviceability. Um, as I mentioned before, many of our controllers are compliant with FCC regulations, so you're not going to get any noise interference uh, caused by the controller. Um, and in terms of scalability, our controllers can be connected in parallel uh, without using any type of communications link between them, which is something that um, is very different than a lot of our competitors um, because we are measuring uh, battery voltage directly on the battery terminals and um, our feedback loop is so tight we're doing calculations so quickly to such a high degree of accuracy uh, that we really don't need any type of communication. They automatically sync together and are, are getting the same reading um, of, of battery voltage. Uh, and then the last bullet on this slide talks about environmental protections um, that we, as Morningstar, uh, typically incorporate into our controllers. I'll tell you about a couple of them on the next slide. Um, the first one pertains to what's known as epoxy encapsulation. Uh, so I'll use an example here of our SunSaver controller, that, the small PWM controller we talked about earlier. Um, you'll see in the picture on top, it's just in its normal uh, cover on. This is how it would look out in the field. And then if you take the cover off, you'll see this hard, shiny plastic that's uh, coating all of the printed circuit board and up against all of the electrical components um, underneath the faceplate. And what that does is it helps to completely isolate uh, the electronics, protect them against uh, any dust, debris, accumulating or getting into uh, areas where they could cause uh, extra heat and um, it's going to keep it basically watertight. Now this protects against uh, humidity and airborne particles. It's really something that any electrical device manufacturer should do, but unfortunately many of our competitors do not um, for costs or other reasons. Um, now you also find uh, another environmental protection known as conformal coating. This is something that we do during the assembly process um, of our printed circuit boards. Our, we have a spray nozzle here that is completely automated, spraying a fine mist of silicone uh, all over the uh, surface of the PCB, um, just making sure that there is a nice kind of hydrophobic surface uh, all along these electrical components. Um, making sure that water, dust, and debris uh, just slides right off and um, adds another layer of protection to uh, you know, our very reliable product. Um, you also see from this picture here, we do use surface mount components, and they are precisely assembled by machine. So we're not looking at any sloppy hand solder joints that you may see in some of our competitors. Um, everything is placed to high precision uh, for a reason. It was well thought out during the design process um, and again ultimately leads to a very reliable high quality product. Uh, so next we'll take a look at how the efficiency of a Morningstar controller uh, will vary at different power outputs. This is another um, characteristic of our MPPT controllers that makes them a bit unique. Um, just to run through this quickly, what you see here are two different curves representing two different controllers in the industry. I'll give it away that controller number one is from Morningstar. <laughs> uh, I won't say who controller number two is, but um, this is actually fairly characteristic of what you will see in the industry from some of our competitors um, who either don't share their efficiency information and then when you come to test it, you realize that, yes, 
they're quoting a high efficiency number on the data sheet, but when you get it going at full power, your realistic uh, efficiency um, conversion is actually a lot less. Um, and it's a number of whole percentage points different than what you'll find from a Morningstar controller that's going to reach its peak power very early on and it's going to hold that peak efficiency, I'm sorry, it's going to re reach its peak efficiency very early on and it's going to hold it all the way through to the peak power um, of that controller. And so uh, you want to make sure that you get this information from your manufacturer up front if they don't publish it. Uh, make sure that the efficiency number that they're quoting you on the data sheet actually corresponds to what you're going to get at full power because after all that's why you're buying you know so many watts of output that's how much you want to get under normal uh, operating conditions and if you don't uh, it leads to a lot of disappointment so um, just to put into context here you know I talked about uh, whole percentage points different uh, difference in terms of efficiency numbers amongst MPPT competitors in our industry. In the grid tied industry, if you're looking at a, a string inverter, a lot of times, you know, people will quibble over a, a quarter of a percent um, as significant. So this really puts into context, uh, you know, how much you're realistically getting out of your controller. Not only that, but the lower the efficiency number, the more uh, power is dissipated in the form of heat. So you're actually generating heat, which has an adverse effect to the, the controller's lifespan, um, but you're also not getting as much power out of it as you would expect uh, based on its ratings. So you really want to uh, pay attention to these numbers and make sure you're getting high efficiency um, that's going to be seen throughout low, medium, and high output power levels. So I have a quick question for you, um, and this will help to explain the next topic, which is oversizing. So the question is, what happens if the maximum power point of an oversized PV array exceeds what's known as the nominal operating power rating of a Morningstar MPPT controller? So A, B, or C, the controller will not be damaged, the controller will be damaged, or the controller's lifespan will be reduced by approximately 50%. Well. On the next slide, I'll show you the answer here. Now, the answer is A. So, and this is something that is specific for Morningstar MPPT controllers. I cannot say this about any other manufacturer's MPPT controllers. Um, and I'll explain why. In our controllers, what's regulating the output is software. So it's going to limit the current from the array to the controller so that the controller is not going to be damaged. You're not going to avoid the warranty. It's all regulated by software, and we're very confident in the quick reacting nature of our software that we could handle any amount of current input to the controller as long as you don't exceed uh, the open circuit voltage. So the open circuit voltage of any controller, uh, whether it's Morningstar or another brand, you really don't ever want to exceed that. That's that's a a steadfast rule uh, for PWMs or MPPTs, don't ever exceed the open circuit voltage. Um, now, we'll talk about an example here for uh, when oversizing may be beneficial um, to use with Morningstar controllers, and we'll look at a couple different uh, circumstances um, to see the effects of what's actually harvested in the battery. So. What's happening here is, show these curves. So we have two different um, arrays. So we're comparing our SunSaver MPPT, which is our smallest MPPT, and this is for a 12 volt battery. So we're only looking at 200 watts of maximum harvesting uh, that the controller can actually convert to the battery. Um, that does not mean that it can't take more on the input and then just selectively take what it's able to handle without damage to the controller. So you'll see here uh, making this example with our 200 watt module to match the 200 watt nominal rating of the SunSaver MPPT. And then what happens if we juice that module up a bit and look at a 240 watt model? 
So you'll see here, in terms of production, your 240 watt module is going to have the peak cut off. So it may be making 240 watts at peak, and this is a full sunny day, so you have plenty of solar resource available. This portion in red is not actively being converted into the battery. So uh, you are losing that power. But what are you gaining? You're gaining these areas in green. And when you empirically sort it out and do the measurements, these, the area contained in the green here is actually twice as much as what's contained in the red. So in other words, you're gaining twice as much energy as you're losing by using the 240 watt module as opposed to the 200 watt module in clear sunny conditions. And that equates to, again, from that, uh, you know, 5 to 25 percent more energy figure, you're getting 12 and a half percent more energy harvested by using an oversized array with this MPPT controller than you would by just matching the nominal uh, power rating. So what happens on days when you have intermittent sun and clouds? Um, kind of dark and gloomy. Well, this is really when you're going to need the power the most. So having the added output of that 240 watt module um, co when compared with the 200 watt module, almost all of the added benefit you're getting um, in these peaks is going to translate into direct conversion to charge the battery. And only the top 1% of production is cut off. So you're really losing very little, but gaining a lot in using that 240 watt module. So it really seems that it's most beneficial uh, on cloudy days when you'll take every bit of sun you can get. Um, but it seems in both cases, oversizing arrays can have a lot of advantage. So something that you want to consider, and it's something that you can do freely with uh, Morningstar MPPT controllers. So another common feature of every Morningstar MPPT controller is uh, our tracking algorithm, which we have designated TrackStar. Um, so what it's doing is it's ensuring fast and accurate tracking of, of that maximum power point that we saw originally on that IV curve. And it's making sure that it stays on that as frequently as possible uh, throughout the entire day. But every MPPT controller is going to have their own version of this algorithm. And the TriStar MPPT controllers uh, that have TrackStar, they're going to actually provide what we've seen, 2 to 7 percent, or perhaps even more than that, um, charging difference uh, in terms of energy harvested on a daily basis from the same array, same conditions, compared to other MPPT controllers on the market. So, um, that just shows you that not all MPPT controllers are created equal. Um, some tracking algorithms are much more sophisticated and, and superior to others on the market in terms of uh, usable charging that you're going to be able to get from them. Um, and the TrackStar algorithm in particular is extremely accurate, very fast. Uh, it sweeps that whole IV curve in just a fraction of a second, whereas uh, many of our competitors you'll see in the industry, they may take up to 10 seconds, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it is relative to the fact that we do it much quicker than that, which means we're spending more time operating at the true maximum power point, which is, at the end of the day, what you want to do to squeeze the most energy from the array as possible. Some controllers may even take over a minute uh, to do the sweeping process. So it is something that you really want to sort through, make sure you have all the um, all the information from your uh, manufacturer before you choose uh, your MPPT. Now on the next slide, um, we'll take a look at the SureSign inverter. That's just to switch gears here. Uh, the one product we haven't spoken about yet. So as I mentioned in one of the original slides, um, we had the uh, AC load system. We do have a small off-grid inverter, uh, battery-based. Um, it's ideal for rural electrification, uh, telecom, mobile. It's found in marine installations. Uh, anything requiring a little bit of AC power, um, like that TV, that is perfect uh, for a sure sign. 
And the sure sign has <coughs> very low self-consumption. It's just 450 milliamps, and that's when it's powering loads. Uh, when it's not powering loads, it can go into a mode, a standby mode, and then it can actually reduce its self-consumption to just 10% of that, so just 45 milliamps, which is very impressive. Um, it is available in both 115 volt output at 60 hertz and 220 volt output at 50 hertz. Um, and both versions are going to provide 300 watts of continuous output power. Uh, they're also going to have 200% for the surge uh, capability, uh, of which it can sustain 600 watts for a period of approximately 10 minutes. Um, they are configured for 12 volt battery systems on the input. Uh, they're really meant for systems that need to optimize reliability. You can see the, the very environmentally ruggedized chassis design. Uh, it's actually pretty heavy and substantial um, uh, to help it withstand the most unforgiving of conditions. Um, and then just to wrap up, we also have uh, a number of accessories that can be used with our products. Um, a ground fault protection device, you'll see here, a uh, selection of meters, um, we have the remote temperature sensor, some communication adapters. Um, those are all uh, very useful for a variety of um, functionality uh, in, in a system. Uh, if you go onto our website, you just type in the word accessory into the search bar. Uh, it'll actually come up with a link to a chart that shows you which one is compatible with each device. Um, so that's a pretty handy resource. Um, Speaking of handy resources, this is our Morningstar string calculator. Uh, you can find this easily on our website by just typing in the word string into the search bar. Um, and you'll come up with this page. <coughs> I definitely recommend that you bookmark it because um, it's something that you probably use more than you realize. Um, this would let you know uh, it, it really helps for sizing your system. So, if you need to know how many modules you can use with any given controller for any given battery system, um, it's really helpful in showing you, you know, the optimal series and parallel configurations of those. Um, and you can, there's an extensive uh, drop-down menu of many different um, solar panel manufacturers to choose from uh, in addition to selecting the proper Morningstar product. Um, very handy resource. So just to wrap things up, uh, I'll summarize what we learned here. All charge controllers not equal, right? So we have uh, you know many different amperage and voltage ratings um, that you'll see in a number of different products throughout the industry. You'll have differences in charging algorithms. Um, you know higher level of advanced feature content, electronic protections, um, all kinds of things that uh, make one different from the next. But charge controllers are providing so much of that core functionality to a solar system that you really don't want to pinch your pennies on it. You want to make sure that you're investing in the proper equipment to maintain uh, health uh, of your batteries and health of your system overall. Um, and a, a failed controller, again, that part goes down. You're looking at uh, irreparable effects of that on your other more costly system components. So again, put a lot of thought into the charge controller that you're going to choose for uh, you know, the um, health and safety of your system. For over 20 years, Morningstar has been doing this. We've been focusing on designing, providing these high quality, reliable products, uh, mostly focusing on off-grid. And we have a great network of global distributors to support us. Um, we've had the same ownership management and strategy since the very beginning, so not much has changed here. Um, and many of our distribution partners, they've been with us since the very beginning. Um, and they're, you know, very valuable partners to provide uh, any information that you may need as a customer, uh, pricing, service, technical support, uh, and they can do that for your entire solar system needs. Um, so that wraps up the, uh, the presentation content. Uh, we'll do a quick q and I'll go ahead and pass it over to Doug. Let me just see what uh, questions came in here. Bear with me one second. All right. Okay, so Doug, um, quick question. Um, 
we have one here from a user who's asking whether custom programming is actually required. Uh, do you have an answer to that? Uh, generally not. Uh, we have built-in uh, presets for all of our controllers. Some of our controllers can't be programmed, so you're kind of stuck with those presets. Uh, though they are made for sealed and flooded batteries, they might not be optimized for your particular battery, so we do have uh, several controllers with custom programming uh, as an option, uh, but uh, depending on your battery, uh, it's not necessary to custom program. Uh, it may be uh, desirable uh, for some people. They want to get the, exactly what they want, and also uh, some batteries uh, will not conform to our, you know, uh, our custom settings, especially newer uh, technologies. So uh, it is a good option if, if you need that. Okay. Um, let's do a few more here. Um, another question, would the voltage from the 60 cell modules be enough with the PWM controller? That's a good question. So I assume this is uh, regarding a 24 volt uh, uh, PV system, a uh, solar system. Uh, the batteries would be 24 volt nominal, in which case, uh, the 60 cell modules have a BMP of 30 volts and a VOC of 36 volts. It seems like it's uh, plenty high enough, but uh, when it gets hotter, uh, you'll see that the, the voltage reduces uh, due to uh, mo PV module cell temperatures, and you don't have uh, full charging uh, of the PV array. You'll see that PV array starting to want to operate at like uh, 26 volts or something, and that's just not high enough to get it up to the full charging with the bulk charging. So uh, you lose a lot. You know, we've had a lot of customers, especially in hot, hot climates where they had 60 cell modules, they thought it was enough, and it's uh, ending up that their batteries are never really getting fully charged during these hot conditions. And then with 12 volt batteries, it's just too high of a voltage uh, for PWM controllers. Uh, the limit on maximum voltage for a PWM, uh, for a 12 volt PWM controller is 30 volts with our controller, so that's typically a, a 36 cell module. Okay, very good. Um, two, maybe a couple more. Uh, what is the parasitic draw of the ProStar MPPT? Do you know that offhand, Doug? Uh, sure. I, uh, Answered this by text. It's uh, it's uh, the normal operation is 0.6 watts, and then the maximum is one watt. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that maximum power is the power with the uh, with the Here. display on. Uh, so the, the usage is is just very small. Yeah. The self consumption or or the parasitic draw is, is small. Okay. Um, uh, does Morningstar offer any solar controllers that have low electrical noise? Uh, well, the PWM controllers can make a good, good amount of noise because their pulse width modulation is it's, uh, you know, not very high frequency, but it's enough to make, make noise, even audible noise, and then also uh, transmit uh, radio frequencies. So we offer many of our uh, PWM controllers. You can check the manuals. Uh, we have a uh, option to disable, or not not really disable the PWM, but, but to slow it down significantly. So it's more like a switching, slow switching of the PWM. So it's not going to generate any noise, and it's slow enough where it won't be audible. It won't be uh, creating any uh, radio frequencies. Uh, with our MPVT controllers, the ProStar MPVT and TriStar MPVT are both uh, rated uh, FCC uh, Part 15 Class B compliant, so that's uh, that's so it will not uh, generate that much noise, but it, it can generate noise. So you want to, um, you know, possibly see if it's going to be a problem or not. Uh, there are uh, we have a little bit of information if you. Look at if you just 
type of noise, they'll see some ways to alleviate that. One of the things is uh, better grounding, uh, shorter wire runs, which can create less uh, uh, RF uh, noise generation. So uh, there's also some other points that you might want to check out. Uh, if you do a search on, on our website, you can go to the support library and there's uh, try to keep the searches basic. You can look up pretty much many different topics that way. All right. Um, any other ones that you wanted to take, Doug, or you think that's good? We'll take the rest offline. Uh, sure. I just want to mention someone asked about LVD. Can this be set? They can be set independently. So uh, you can set the low voltage uh, to one voltage, and then you can independently set the reconnect. Uh, so that's nice for different types of batteries where uh, you might want to have that custom capability. So oh, that's good. And then we have a uh, we have a lot of resources on our website. If we didn't get your uh, your question, we'll be answering the next uh, week or sometime over the next week. Uh, we generally get to it, you know, sometime in the week following, and we'll we'll get back to you. But if not, you can see if you can find any information on our website. It might be helpful. That sounds good. Well, thanks, Doug, for answering the questions. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, we'll see you next time.